I'd like to welcome uh, everybody to our session here called uh, Advice for the Mega City. And uh, thank you all for coming. And I, I can't tell you how honored, well, first of all, how, how incredible just being here for Aspen Ideas is for me and my wife, Rana, but how honored I am to be able to host this session. Um, for those of you who know me, you know I've worked on and studied cities for a long time now, more than three decades. And uh, there are a lot of great mayors in the world now, but, but none, none is, is, is great as this man. Uh, he, Thank you. Thank you. He's defined the office. In the modern time, he's defined the office of a, a progressive, business-appreciating, city-building mayor. Mr. Mayor, you're one of my personal mentors and one of my personal heroes. Uh, Richard M. Daley was elected to mayor in 1989 when I was five. No, that's not true at all. <laughs> I was in my 30s. Uh, he served for 22 years, making him the longest-serving mayor in the history of the great city of Chicago surpassing the tenure of his father, Richard J. Daly. He has so many awards and honors. They're just too numerous to mention. He was named Municipal Leader of the Year, Public Official of the Year, Politician of the Year, and, and, and so many more. And, you know, we were just talking about my, my city of Toronto, uh, where we've had a little bit of a leadership crisis, I'll say gently. And uh, we were talking about how cities, how cities like Toronto and other cities can can build on what, he, what he's done and what he's learned. So we're going to have a wide-ranging conversation. Uh, the mayor and I have known each other for a long time. He took me on a personal tour of his great city. I have, you know, I have a Jimi Hendrix bench. Oh, yeah. yeah, from what was I it, know. Lot 37? Yes. Yeah. I bought the Jimi Hendrix because Jimi Hendrix was my boyhood idol the day you took me there. And uh, we want to have a broad-ranging conversation. And we'll talk for a little while, and then hopefully you guys will fire up some, some really good questions. And, you know, this is Aspen, so no holds barred. You know, if, if, if you fire away, at, fire away at the mayor and fire away at us. Um, look, look, we have seen a, a change in America and the world. When I was a boy, born in Newark, cities were down in the dumps. I saw the city my dad worked in, his factory close. I saw that city erupt in riots as a 10-year-old boy in 1967. Uh, I saw the city across the water in New York go into a fiscal crisis, and all of my professors in graduate school said, oh, the cities are dead. They're dead. Well, everybody's going to move to the suburbs. But what's happened, and the mayor has been part of this, cities all across the United States, big cities are back, and these mega cities really have become new entities. I, don't want, to talk, I want the mayor to talk about that. So, so what we want to talk about is how the mega city has emerged, what you've done, and then what your advice, or, and I can wing, wing in on this, what, for, for mayors all over the world. So let's start with the rise of the megacity in your view, Mr. Mayor. How, how do you view its rise, and how do you view it in competition or in, in relevance to the nation state today? Well, I think it's going to completely uh, surpass uh, everything we thought about. It took us 100 years to be an urban society in America. China will do it in 30 years. India will do it in 30 years. Uh, the rest of the world, Brazil, the rest of the world, Mexico, Africa, would do it in 30 years. So you know, surpass the last century and everything what we did. And they're rising because of the importance of people want jobs, information, ideas, culture. They want to be able to live in an environment uh, that their children, grandchildren, would be better off. And so it's moving so quickly. And of course, with technology, helps it. And it's going to go back to city-state, going back centuries. Uh, the power of uh, much of uh, Europe uh, civilization was a city-state. That, that was the key, and it's coming back. If you watch China, the importance of those cities of 40, 50 million people, they have a lot of independence. China's getting it. They realize that now, uh, realize Shanghai, Tianjin, all the cities on the coast, they have to reinforce the inner cities. And now they're moving... Uh, the whole government is moving more uh, money and effort to rebuild the in inner uh, part of their country, just like the Midwest. You take America, we were founded uh, basically by water. Everything was by water. Yeah. Everything came in from the coast and it came down the Mississippi, up the Great Lakes. And cities were founded for a reason. And if you look at cities in the past, what was it? It was all water. It was all trade. And that's how we were founded on trade. But all of a sudden, what comes in? The airline industry. 
changed considerably the trading uh, post of, of America and the rest of the world. And so I think mega cities are here to stay. In America, you have to get mega areas. You take the whole Midwest, you even take Toronto, and you say this is one area that we're going to compete. We have agriculture, we have farming, we have high tech, we have universities, everything there in one area. And that's how we have to compete with the rest of the world. It's not going to be Chicago, it's not going to be LA, it's not going to be Toronto, it has to be regions. I'd like to talk to you to talk a little bit about your great city. And, uh, you know, when I was young, people thought Chicago was dirty, it, it was polluted. The people were leaving Chicago to go to the clean and green suburbs. But during your tenure, during those 22 years, it's probably perhaps the greatest urban turnaround in, in modern history. So what were the, you know, the mega region right. is now millions of yes, people, right. almost two trillion and a half. What were the keys, Mr. Mayor, as of that turnaround? What were the things that you did or that others did to, to bring that city back so now it's gaining population? Right. First of all, the reason why people left cities, the interstate highway system, brought, you know, uh, suburban or collar counties into Chicago. And secondly, education. Once the federal government said they're going to control urban education, only in big cities, not suburban area, it destroyed the cities. And people said, wait, after the 60s, what has happened to our education? People fled. It didn't matter who you were. Middle class are fleeing the city because of public schools. And that really changed it. But really, uh, Chicago is always, always changing. And the most interesting thing is the public-private partnership. Take the University of Chicago, public-private partnership. You take the Burnham Plan, public-private mm -hmm. partnership. Reversing the Chicago River, public-private partnership. You take Millennium Park, school reform in Chicago. It isn't the government, it's the business community and non-for-profit working with the city in order to basically improve the quality of life. And improving the quality of life, the people who live there have to see changes. I mean, people get elected, and all of a sudden they talk about the grandiose ideas, but every day you get out, you walk down the street, you get on the bus, you get in a cab, you drive your car. What has changed? And you have to change the quality of life. That means graffiti, that means abandoned buildings, that means infrastructure, that means new schools, new libraries. They have to see change, and when they see change, they firmly believe that the city's in the right direction. And cleanliness is very important, not from the city's perspective of paying for it, that every private owner of every piece of property, you take downtown or many business people, I mean, it's, it's spotless, not because of the city, it's because their attitude is that they have their business here, they, re they reside maybe here or in the surrounding communities, and they want to participate in a way that really reflective. So everybody's talking about public-private partnerships in America. They should go right to Chicago and talk mm -hmm. to all the business people. Many of them are here, and they'll tell you about public-private partnership. Every museum, every university, every hospital, public-private partnership. So I, I saw this that when we met. You know, I you, you, I'd come to downtown many times as a young person, as a young professor, but and that was spectacular. But I had a colleague, University of Chicago professor, an eminent sociologist, and he took me for a tour. I wrote about this in Rise of the Creative Class. And he took me to neighborhoods that were poor, yep. but it, by income. But I couldn't tell because of exactly what you said. There were green trees. I had thought of a poor neighborhood being a barren neighborhood, no trees with dirt, you know, me messed up conditions. And it looked like a, it was. It was a strong family already. And that's because of the focus on the neighborhoods. I want to ask you about this thing about business. Because Ron and I moved to Toronto, but we're Americans. We Actually, your business community, I think it was Global Business Chicago, yes. introduced us uh, way back when. And what I noticed is that in America, in our cities, but I think more than any other city, Chicago, you have this business community going back a century or more, right? You mentioned the Burnham Plan, that has been active, that has been investing, that has created resilience. So you, and you're a Democrat. Uh, you're a progressive Democrat. You're a person who cares about working people from, from your whole history. How, what do you think is the role, especially for those of us who may not be American, but of, of that business community, that strong business community, in creating the capacity to, to build and rebuild and set a city on a growth course? Well, I, what happens is many times mayor are elected on a partisan basis. I got elected on a partisan basis, and I changed it very rapidly to a nonpartisan basis. Uh, because, because you have to understand that people will support different candidates for different offices. And, and you should not take an attitude that they're supporting this candidate or that, that candidate. The only attitude you should take are they supporting Chicago. And so you allow everybody, it's a free democracy, let them support any candidate you want, whether for president, for governor, for any other office. And so when you allow that, you allow their independence. 
Many times mayors are elected in big cities as Democrats, so they think that the Democratic Party historically has to stay as is. And if they don't change, they'll live in the past. And the business community can move any place in America. But in Chicago, they, 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 I mean, school reform, school reform would not be possible if not their support they gave to me through the efforts in the General Assembly. And that, that's an example. Republican governor, Republican General Assembly. It wasn't for the business community standing up. We need changes, and that's what they did. But to me, I'm an envy, uh, and Rahm Emanuel's uh, envy, our present mayor, uh, of uh, many mayors because of the business community working continually on behalf of the betterment of the city. And that is, I think it reflects American businesses. I, I, I always give speeches on this because we give more money to charity American businesses, individually and collectively and corporations than the rest of the world. And so this is something that we should respect. That doesn't mean there are different opinions and issues, but overall, we have the best business community in the world, right, right here in America, and we should be proud of that. And I was on the board of the AGO, which is our art museum in Toronto, and they invited a guy from New York, but, but he was talking about the museums and donorship and the history of donorship in America, which we take for granted, how business has <laughs> built so many, and especially when times are lean, and governments has to, cut, we have to do more with less. One thing you've mentioned, which I find fascinating, is it's, it's, you know, companies face hard times. Some, sometimes they decline. Sometimes companies move out. Sometimes companies move in. But you're very interesting that you mentioned education, colleges and universities. I remember you told me the story about your dad, which touched me, where, especially as a working class kid with a factory worker father with a seventh grade education, you said your dad looked at the private schools and he saw a rich, you're not a rich kid, but you know what I'm saying, I could go to Northwestern or go to University of Chicago. Your dad said there needs to be a place for working class kids, the, the University right. of Illinois, Chicago. You talked about universities, you talked about arts and cultural institutions, these anchors. I call them the anchor institutions of a community. Tell us about how those anchor, arts and culture, right. education, university, how those anchor institutions create that Resist resilience in a well, town. Well, just like a corporation, you have to look at your core strength, your assets. And the assets of the city were universities, hospitals, museums, cultural institutions. And if you don't keep them strong, if you don't keep them strong, it, everything will change around it. But if you don't allow them to expand, and work in the 70s, 60s and 70s, that was a problem in American cities. Many of them said, no, you cannot expand. Chicago always allowed that because those are your strong assets. You build off of that. And if you don't build off of that, you lose it. And many cities have lost it. Now they're trying to come back. But to me, uh, that's what you have to have, that rapport. And here's an example. We have the, one of the last free zoos in America, is Lincoln Park Zoo. <laughs> if it wasn't for the business community stepping up and working and how many hundreds of thousands of children from Chicago public schools visit that, that Lincoln Park Zoo? Just think, on a, on, on a weekly basis, yearly basis, continually, free service. And it wasn't for the business community supporting that. It's public-private institution. So when I was mayor, I gave the non-for-profit the full control of the museum. No government response. In other words, we put money into it, let them manage it and they manage it much better because I believe government has to get out of certain things they cannot manage within government and they should admit that but if they don't uh, the folly keeps going on and on it gets worse. So here's one for you. I lived in Pittsburgh. I know we both yes. have a mutual fondness for, for the town. Your wife was yeah, from Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Your late wife was from Pittsburgh. And uh, um, the young mayor there, got a guy, he, he said that he needs money and the way he could get it was taxing, or in lieu of taxing, I don't know what he called it, he had a word right. for it, but making the nonprofits pay their fair share. What do you think of this idea? Well, I always had a, a problem with that because the, the number of people the uh, not-for-profits employ, the universities and hospitals and all that, it is amazing in the input they put in the city and also the number of people who work there and live in the city. And all of a sudden you start taxing that. I know it's a question even in Illinois, but they have to be very, very careful because we bring the best and the brightest in various professions to live within uh, the city in a metropolitan area. And, and that speaks itself, both the city and metropolitan area. It's not just the city itself. You have to include the metropolitan area. You have to say that what's good for the city is good for the suburban area, good for the suburban area is good for the city. So all the problems are the same. 
And you have to be very careful how far you go on that. And, and so some of them have real problems. Rhode Island, I know Providence just did something with Brown University, uh, Boston, uh, Cambridge is going to be doing something. But if it's a trend, then I'm afraid it's going to go to many non-for-profits and museums and things like that. It would not be acceptable. No, I, I agree with you entirely. And, you know, Peter Drucker always said the non-profit was the key to the knowledge economy. You mentioned the metro. And this is another thing. Before myself and Bruce Katz and all of us at Brookings got into this, you, you taught us about this. And one thing I remember when I visited you, you were organizing of course, you ran the Conference of Mayors, but you were organizing a metropolitan, I don't know what you had a name for it, right. but you were actually working with all the mayors of the suburban areas, tens or dozens of these, and creating a common vision. Could you talk about that? We have 250 mayors outside the city of Chicago in about six counties. It's 70 percent, 80 percent of the population of Illinois. And what I said to all of them, why are we always fighting? So when I first got elected in 89, the first decision I was faced with, Sears is looking for a new location. They're going to move out of the city of Chicago, they're going to go to North Carolina, Texas, or northwest suburban area in Chicago, outside Chicago. What was my decision? It was easy. I said, as long as they stay in the metropolitan area. And I supported that. Some people got mad, but at least they're staying in Illinois. And so what you look at is you have to understand certain things can fit in an urban area, in a big city. But you have to allow certain industries to be able to move outside, outside the large city. And so we came together since 95. We, work, we go to Congress. We go to uh, Springfield. No Democrats, Republicans. We all go as elected officials. And uh, it works out unbelievable. We have mayors from uh, Wisconsin. We have mayors from northern Indiana, all the way down to Peoria, Rock Island. Uh, we get mayors. Uh, so what we do is bring them all together and work on common problems. Don't let the political system divide us. The political system was dividing everybody, both in Springfield and Washington. And we set that aside and said, we're going to go as a group. You know, when I think of Chicago's history, because I've read your, your history a lot, and the union history, the labor history, yeah. the urban history, I remember, I think your city defined the idea of the city beautiful. Am I right about that? The city beautiful was something that emerged in Chicago. And one of the things that really defined your tenure, and you taught so many of us, is that so many people were saying, yeah, beauty, baloney, we need, and we do need low crime, and you said good schools, beauty, that's an afterthought. If we, but, but you really, even with the flower, I mean, I, I don't mean the flower pots and the trees and the idea of downtown being a beautiful place, you really, and you were saying that people need to see change, but, but people resonate with beauty in a great city. Can you talk about how important that, that, that the aesthetic, if you will, the quality of the place, the, the greening is to make it a, a good well, mega we, city? We always thought that the environment, I always thought environment was part of the city. And if you have to go someplace to enjoy the environment, the aesthetics of the city, it's kind of sad. Architecture, we were the best. And so what we basically did, brought the private sector, Crate and Barrels right here, and mm -hmm. Michigan Avenue, what they did there, they were the first, foremost on Well Street, the same way. Companies giving back, which is really important, saying, here, I, I have pride in my business, and I want to have pride in the sidewalk and the street. And what we did is uh, the, the, the environment can coexist. So more open space, more parks, more uh, green roofs, more trees, more flowers, more fountains, cleanliness. We did an ex-offender homeless program. Uh, we train them in not-for-profits and faith-based organizations. They clean the streets. They do the landscaping. And so you're really benefiting the city socially, taking, working with the homeless, working with reentry people. They have jobs. They have a work record. And so what you're trying to tell people is you have to have pride in your city. If you don't, uh, then it's only you know, between Monday and, and Friday, and that's it. The city's dead. And so what you have to show is that uh, all these things are important. We put a Chicago Climate Action Plan together. I had the business leaders, non for profit advocacy groups, and citizens. And we came up with a plan. We never mandate. I hate mandates because mandate is always forcing something down someone's mm -hmm. throat. And my belief is that if you don't work with the business community, I said, we're going to go first. We're going to tell you how much it's going to cost in green roofs. So we did things first, the city did, instead of exempting ourselves. So all the things, the changes we made, every LEED certified building in the city of Chicago, municipal buildings, were the first to get platinum rating. We were the first to do this. But I wanted to show the business community it can be done. And of course, they follow, and they will follow. Now, Ch Chicago is a real beacon for, for our country and particularly for the Midwest. I want you to reflect on, you know, I lived in Pittsburgh for nearly 20 years. 
I live in Toronto now, which is also a city on the upswing. My wife, Ron, is from the greater Detroit area. If we take that heartland area, the, what, what John Gottman, the great geographer, called the Chicago-Pittsburgh, he called it the mega right. region, which goes from Milwaukee to Chicago to Ohio to Cleveland, down to Pittsburgh, over to Toronto, how, what could we do? You, you know, do we, can we bring back manufacturing? Do we focus on the universities? Do we need a high-speed rail? So do we need a better connection point between these cities? What could we do thinking ahead for this great industrial heartland that built the country? How do we bring it? Now, Chicago has had its revival, but other cities haven't. How do we right. take that region and, and restoke its engine? I think you have to find out why it was founded. Buffalo, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Detroit, why were they founded? And, so, and that's the past. They never changed. So you have huge metropolitan areas. The only existence they can do is you have to have a large concentration. It's not just Chicago competing, it's the region. If you only compete as Cleveland, they can't do it. Detroit can't do it. Pittsburgh, Buffalo, even Chicago can't do it by itself. Yep. The things that we have, we have a water. We have transportation. We have both rail and both we have both uh, uh, air transportation. Uh, we have wonderful universities. We have history of manufacturing, which is changing to technology. And if you look at it, the technology of manufacturing, we're going to manufacture it back in America because energy is going to be less costly because of because the findings that we're all throughout North Dakota, all the energy findings we're finding out with gas. And so that is that's amazing. So it's going to go. It's, it's struggling. But you have to put everyone together. You have to set down these political subdivisions apart and say, if you want to exist, you better come together. I mean, if you take Detroit, I think most of the fire and policemen live in Ohio. They don't live in Detroit. There's no, no reflection upon what Detroit is. Mm -hmm. you, can't, you cannot build the automobile industry and say that's yeah. the only industry we're going to have. They have the University of Michigan. They have great universities. And, and figure they have to build off of that. And so all the Midwest has to come together. I believe that. If they don't come together, uh, we're going to lose basic in competition. Exporting is important for medium-sized companies. And J.P. Morgan in Brookings is doing, we have forums, we have one in California. Here we have the, uh, we have the people from L.A. in the port, in the airport, in the water port, in Long Beach. Then we went in the high technology in San Diego. Imperial Valley is basically uh, agricultural. Northern New Mexico is manufacturing. We bring them all together. That's the only way they're going to export. But there's 60 programs in the federal government. 60 different executive directors, 60 different laws, rules, and regulations. So medium-sized business has to spend a mi about a million dollars of consultants to try to venture into one of them. And so we're, we're saying consolidate it, go online, tell them what legal and financial responsibilities can they export with 250 workers in Ohio manufacturing a certain product. That's the only way manufacturing mid-sized businesses are going to come back. And, and basically, who wants to invest in those? China. They like manufacturing, and they think if we don't want to rebuild manufacturing, they will rebuild it for us, and they will invest heavily in manufacturing in the Midwest. So I, I know what you talk of because I just rated and ranked. I re did all my rankings again. You know, everybody knows I like to do this. But what was striking to me, good, big cities did good. Chicago did good. New York did good and so on. But the college towns, and, and the number one was Boulder, right, he, right here in this state. But Ann Arbor was fourth. Madison was in the top ten. All these college towns that are in many in the Midwest are the seeds of a rebirth. And, and oftentimes, I noticed this in Pittsburgh, because now it's like in Pittsburgh, they had the colleges in the, in, in the town, like in, some in Chicago. But some of our city leaders were a little bit scared of the colleges and universities because they brought a different voter. You know, who wasn't the old Joe Sixpack, well, you know what I'm saying. They brought a different voter. So I remember saying, you know, we have to do something around the colleges and universities, but they were saying, yeah, we'll do it when the students leave. You know, don't, yeah, that's fine, but do it when the students leave. It's our downtown. But you seem to be saying that, of course, our downtowns and our old cores are important. But this rebuilding around the colleges and universities, which for a Detroit is, there are some in the city, but some in Ann Arbor, some in Lansing, the same thing. But there's some way that this legacy of land grant, right, that's in our Midwest states, and in other states as well that we can build around. Do you have any other reflections on well, that? Well, if you look at uh, Austin, Texas, it's a state capital and, and it's university town. Take Madison, Columbus, Ohio. That's the key. They're both a state capital yep. and a university, and they have really benefited. But the key in these smaller cities, of course, are hospitals and universities or colleges. And if it wasn't for that, 
most of them would not be in existence. But we have to reflect what we're doing in regards to certain cities. And, and I hate to say it, whether or not will they exist? Will they exist? You know, they're going to exist differently. It's not just going to be like Memphis itself. It's going to maybe be the whole region. Otherwise, Memphis cannot keep up the cost of operating government with no industry. And so that's how we, we reflect, and it's very difficult in political subdivisions. But in the long run, uh, China, has, uh, China has the attitude of uh, they can do a lot, and they just consolidate more and more. That's what they're doing in the cities. And that's what you have to compete against, and America has to come back and reflect upon that. But again, it's the federal government. If you see the federal government, they destroy big cities yep. through public housing initiatives. Yep. No one can work in public housing, and no one can get married in public housing. In 1959, my father and Paul Douglas went mm -hmm. to Washington and said, don't build high-rises. Again, federal dictate, we have the answers yep. right down the chute. Public education, they said, okay, we're going to mandate this. They, they mandate everything in big cities, mandating everything, and nothing is really accomplished through education or justice department. They basically destroyed us. They destroyed the middle class. I'd like you to talk more about this because in the New Deal, we forged this new federalism, right, where the federal government was going to help the city. But what you're saying is we need to yeah. redo our federalism, and we need to give the cities, because they're the wealth generators. There's no, the cities are the wealth generators in this country. Right. We need to give the cities more power, is what you're saying. How, do you have any ideas well, on how we can start? Well, here, like, we're talking about immigration. Why, why are we talking about immigration? <laughs> the federal government did it. They did not correct it. They're going to mayors and governors and business people. They're the ones who had full control, responsibility for immigration. And where are we today? We're still debating it. They're the ones, once they had the responsibility, they couldn't fix that. And so I am very critical, if not of the Obama administration, every administration going back, because since Roosevelt, he had power in, the, in, the, in, in, in basically in, in the domestic policy, in the international policy. We have diminished the power away from the executive branch to the legislative branch. Now, how do, what, is that, what does that mean? Board of Directors. Could you see your Board of Directors meeting every day in your office building continually all year round? <laughs> Congress meets every day all year round. They have more impact upon the bureaucracy than the executive branch because they know he's going to be four, eight years, the president's going to be there, and that's it. And they know that. And so that's what you change from an executive branch of government from the White House now to really a legislative branch. And they have much more power today than they ever had in the history of the country. And that is not good for the executive branch of government. It's funny, I was talking in this building yesterday with Walter Isaacson and David Bradley, and we were trying to think what were the biggest attended sessions. And we both laughed when we, we the dysfunctional Congress, the dysfunctional well, Congress had a, had a line around the building of people wanted to hear, and we all said, well, we know it's dysfunctional. We've got to make it less dysfunctional. Well, you know, it's, it's surprising. They want everything to be transparent in local government. Nothing transparent in the Justice Department. I can't, you can't find anything. They spent $50 million or $80 million on this case, $70 million. Where's the transparency? Where's the transparency of the federal government? But they dictate to us. They, they lecture to us, and that's the federal government sitting up here. And I'm one who firmly believes we should dilute the power of the federal government. The more we, we do with that, the better city-state and better you have in international relations. Mayors yeah. can work with other mayors. Governments mm -hmm. get in the way. I'll give you an example. Recently, we, I, a law office opened an office in, in Shanghai. I was giving the letter presentation. It looked out. There's a Catholic uh, principal from a local high school, St. Pat's High School, Christian Brothers, I went to De La Salle. I have brothers. Christian brother for me, too, Queen and of so Peace. I looked out, and I said, did he come all the way to Shanghai to see the former mayor give a speech? No. And so I went down to talk to him, and he said, Rich, I recruit students from China the last three years at a Catholic school. None of them are Catholic. Mm -hmm. They're all coming here from wonderful, prominent families, going to universities out of that school, and what they want is discipline and moral values. And so he's, do he's a way into the government. And so recently, when I was in Washington, I told the story, and Someone said, well, how do you get, you know, all the visas from the, uh, from the State Department? And I just gave a joke. I said, well, I'm a Catholic. I go to the Vatican. It's easy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a little inside joke. Uh, but the complications of the federal government dealing with China, dealing with Russia, dealing with Brazil, I, I mean, it gets in the way of what we want to do as business, what we want to do as 
basically mayors, and I, I continue to say that, and I have respect for people there, but it is so bureaucratic and dysfunctional. And there are good people there. There are good people, well-intentioned, but they're getting in the way of this century. Last century, we, are, we had both economic power and military. This century, we should have economic power and humanitarian aid. Absolutely. Otherwise, if we go in the military route, You're China here. would love to see us do that. They hope we do that. You're we'll here. spend all our money there. And they want, they want economic power. And the more I visit there, that's all they talk about. They're not military power. You can have the military power in the United States. All right here, you're going to have it. But we want the economic power. And we should get much smarter from the, what we had in the past and look now in the future. And this is the, the time. This is the decision we're going to make. And until if we don't make the decision to look at humanitarian aid and economic power together, then I think, again, the country will struggle more and more. Christian brothers for me and the, and the sisters of St. Joseph. Look, I still got them from the pointer too, right Joseph. there on the knuckles. Right on the knuckles. In our high school, want, Our Lady so Queen of Peace, we were the Queensmen. We got Lord. pretty tough in New Jersey. <laughs> um, you know, you, you said something very profound, and I want to ask you one more question. I know there's a lot of city builders, and I want to open it up. You said something very profound about the role of cities in, in America and how we got to focus on our economic power and our humanitarian power. And I know people in America think the country faces grave challenges, the rise of the BRICS, China and India. But we're still, and Toronto and Canada are, are doing pretty good, the United Kingdom's doing pretty good, Australia and New Zealand. We're the most open place in the whole god darn world. We have the people still, when I look at our universities coming, University of Toronto, when I look at the kids, look at University of Chicago, we've done Northwestern, coming here in this open-minded society, I, I think the United States, personally, driven by its cities, when, when people talk about the United, I, I think it's bupkis. I, this kid, Dan, this guy Dan Gross, the writer, he's wrote a, written a book about it. Better, stronger, faster, more resilient. I think if we look down for a minute, but you can see the comeback. So I want to ask you one last question. This fellow Ben Barber, he's a pretty good political scientist. I got to review the early draft of his book, and I interviewed him. He calls, what a title, I love this title, I hope you like it, If Mayors Ruled the World. I wish I had that damn title. And he says in that book, that we have to form a league of cities, an international league, and I can think of no one better to inform that. How do we do it? How do we, now you were at the Conference of Mayors, you formed the Metropolitan right. Council. How can we, and maybe it's already happening, maybe you're already part of it, right. but how do we take what you said, that mayor to mayor strength, and what we've accomplished in our cities, but build an internet, whatever we want to call it, a league, an international league of mayors. Where would we start and what's happening on that front? Well, if you look at China, they, they have a, actually it's independent body. And you look at it, they have their own trade policy, investment policy. They're really doing things all over the world in connection with cities or regions. And they don't understand where America is. You know, we want to bash them. We want, we <laughs> want them here. We don't want them here. We, won't, they, we <laughs> want their investment, and we don't want their investment. And so they're saying, well, wh we're going to go where we want to be. And I think they want to come to America. They want to invest like everybody else invested in America. Yep. But some way, there's a lot of hang-ups about that. I think they can revise our, their, our manufacturing, which they like manufacturing. They have a different philosophy. 20, 25 years, good investment, as long as they break even. And, and they're the real thing. And I know a lot of business people do business over there. Uh, the cost of, uh, of uh, labor is going up. Uh, and Malaysia is affecting them. Vietnam is affecting them. Yep. Eventually, Burma is going to affect them, India. And then, of course, you, know, you have uh, low energy costs here. So they're in a dilemma. And my belief is I, I'd rather be friends with the world. And why we yeah, worry? Absolutely. England was uh, number one. We had a revolution against them, and we got economic power. Why are we afraid of uh, competition? That's the thing. Uh, maybe it's we lost our confidence. We should not be afraid of competition. And, and, and America will be strength, uh, so and strong I, in this century because we're so diverse. And, and the open. mayors know that. So how could, we, how could we start? Or where is the start of getting a global league? Of, how do we get your peers? Uh, whether it, that, now the C40 does some of that in the environmental area. But should we, can we, could we build a well, league of the mayors that can be a bulwark against this top-down well, global I, I, policy? Well, I, I hope so, because, you know, a couple of years ago, the first time in America, had all Arab mayors come in uh, to Chicago, the United States, yeah. first time together, about 90 of them. You know what they wanted to talk about? Housing, jobs, economic, they don't want to talk about any international yeah. issues. And, and, and what mayors understand uh, more and more issues dealing with trade policy and dealing with, you know, people moving from one, one city to another city. And that would 
bring them all together. I mean, eventually it's going to happen because China will, will say that. We have 40, 50 million people yep. in this city. And this is like an independent country. And we're going to move our relationships with regions. And that's what they're going to do. Um, I've, I've taken up, a, I've asked you questions. I have plenty more, but I think there's so many other folks that might have a question, so why don't we uh, throw it open? I know there's people with mics, so if you guys can direct me, hold your hand up, and these, these wonderful young women will find you. Keep your hand up, and we'll start. She's got one, so let's start with this, this young woman here. Hello. Uh, my name is Heidi, and I'm the director of a film called Detropia about Detroit, which is actually you playing tonight. So if you're interested in cities, please come see it. I had to plug it, sorry. Um, sure. Five cities in Michigan have declared, have taken on emergency financial managers. Right. And as we know, Detroit narrowly averted one in April. And um, an emergency financial manager can mean voiding union contracts, no more collective bargaining, and all kinds of things that sort of can, you know, a domino effect to the future of a city. So my question to you both is, what is your opinion on this trend to the financial manager? Is it sometimes good for a city? Is it always no. bad? Well, I thought 19, in the 90s, uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut wanted to go bankrupt. I was a few, a minority that was for it. Because you don't have the political will to correct many things because of the power structure. So companies restructure, and they come back just as good. And so if you don't restructure these cities, I don't know how they're going to exist. They have to restructure. You can't say we don't want to restructure. You have to restructure. Things uh, of the past cannot exist today, unfortunately. So you, you can't reorganize in a different way. But if you don't, then they're just going to, they're just going to float, and that's all that's going to happen. And they should not be worried about that, I mean, because they have to be able to pay uh, the cost of operating government. And so the trend is there. Even states will have to eventually do it. Sometimes you have the political will to do it, and the longer, the longer they delay it, the worse off the city will become. Look at Detroit. I mean, to me, uh, there's a great possibilities. Yeah. You should take all those older buildings, retrofit them, and put, uh, put college students in there. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah, and I, the movie's fantastic. I love the movie. Thank you for coming, and please go see it. I, other microphone? Yeah, uh, you talked about how Sears and the concern of Sears right. leaving and what you did to try to keep in the Metroplex right. area as opposed to the city. Can you turn that over and discuss Boeing as an example? Mm -hmm. What were the keys to getting a Boeing to the city? Well, I think uh, the, 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 the government, uh, both the state and the local government, didn't appreciate Boeing. You can't have company towns anymore. I think it was archaic. It's an archaic system. You cannot have a company town. It's not going to exist. And so companies, if they don't diverse throughout America, throughout the world, they're going to live as a company town, and that's not good for them. And so I think they finally reached to a point. Why, why were they there? What happened? How were they established? Oh, okay. They need corporate headquarters. They have to be able to travel. They need a new identity. Uh, you know, and so they figured that they need, they need that. Because I don't think it's going to be company towns. It's not going to be all one industry or one company. That's bad for the companies. So, and so, so what happened politically, they were not accepted there, and, every, and everybody thought they wouldn't leave. Not only that, they built a facility in South Carolina, they built one in Texas. They're going to diversify. Eventually, China's going to tell them, we're going to buy your planes, you're going to build in China. We're tired of this, this bashing of us. And that's what's going to happen to them. But your industries, they like the clean industry. They don't like the manufacturing. You know, Seattle, Oregon, they want the clean industries. They don't want the dirty industries, supposedly, but with clean technology, you're not going to have dirty industries in this century. So what you're saying, I, I think, if I hear you, is that Boeing, it was the big company. Now this was right. Microsoft was there, and, and, and that actually put an extra burden on them in Seattle, that they were, they felt the burden They're a company by that, town. That, you can't have company that, towns anymore. It's, very it's not going to work. And you can see, in, even in the technology industry, when you're a company town, there's some other technology in another city blooming up, and all of a sudden, that technology is old, and all of a sudden, this city becomes Austin, Texas, and all of a sudden, it comes someplace else. It moves very rapidly. So is the story about recruiting and the Art Institute, is that a true story, or is that just a myth, that, that, that the art and the cultural asset of Chicago really played a big role oh, in the, the Boeing? Creative, the, the whole creative class. I mean, that, that's important. They want Where did you hear that? Uh, yeah, right here. <laughs> uh, the creative class. I can't hack my nose. I right. stay. As he knows. Uh, <laughs> but I think it's all part of the city, and, and, and they have to feel like uh, both the government both the state government and city government, and both the business committee wants them here and the not-for-profits. They have to feel that they're welcome. And that's why you have to have a good relationship with business. That doesn't mean you differ with them. One thing I did as mayor, if any business needed help, I go to Washington and Springfield. I didn't, it didn't bother me. 
Why not? I want them to stay here. I want them to prosper. I want them to expand. If not, at least stay within the metropolitan area. And so that had a lot to do with it, the cultural institutions of Chicago. But overall, the business community. I think the ties uh, of the business community throughout America and throughout the world had a lot of effect upon the Boeing movie. Yeah, keep your hands up so these, I saw lots of hands up so these, you don't want to keep them up so they can find you with the mics and I think somebody up here has one for, you can bring it up next time so we get in the queue. Please. Yes, I got one. Mr. Mayor, you did a great job telling us how complex and the job of bringing government and business together, being apolitical and doing a great job leading the city of Chicago. I believe that the, if the toughest job in the United States is president of the United States, the second toughest job is either the mayor of Chicago or the mayor of New York. <laughs> Do you agree? Yes. <laughs> I think it's tougher. But yet, mayors of major cities have not run for president. So you know and why? If you really took your strategy no. to Washington, no. you would you would improve no. the process here, here. in the no, government. But you know why? Because the public employees union, fire, police, uh, fire, police, uh, teachers, uh, ask me. <laughs> And, uh, of course, SEIU never supported me. So I never supported the public employees. I supported the people, and those who were in the union supported me. What, what I was doing, building 59 libraries, 5.5 billion in schools. They knew our infrastructure, leasing public assets, putting the money back into use, and they knew that was important, where the structure of the unions couldn't support me. And mayors fight their own constituency. Yep. If you say they're too long, yep. they're not going to move you into your political system if you're a Democrat. And so that's why not many mayors move up in the political system. What I like to say is... If you stay there long. When I meet a mayor, it's hard for me, to, whether it's John Hickenlooper or you or yeah. Mike Bloomberg, go on, Gavin Newsom. Four years. I can't even tell who's a Democrat and a Republican because no. you're all pragmatic, you're all doing great things. But I think, I think you're right. If, if we had more mayors who could run for a national office, well, we'd be a heck of a lot better But you can only stay country. for four years and you have to run. That's Otherwise, it. yeah, because then you have your own constituents. And then as an example, the public employees right. unions, you know, never endorsed me. So they're not going to endorse me if I ran for governor <laughs> or anything else. No way. So I, I had no interest anyway. I, I want to be <laughs> governor. I want to either one. I, I want to say in Chicago. That was. Mr. Mayor, one of the other aspects of being a mayor in a city as opposed to a, a, a national federal post is you have to run the whole city, right. mm -hmm. from the downtown north side mm -hmm. to the south side. I'm from Chicago, obviously we know each other 15 years, uh, west side. And obviously the things that are happening in Chicago now I know has a lot of us pulling our hair out, the current mayor pulling his hair out, the current uh, police superintendent pulling his hair out, and that's the rise of gangs, yep. violence, and murders uh, at a rate that I don't think it happened while you were there, although yeah, yeah. it occurred, but not at this rate. Right. And when you look at it, and I, I had a chance to talk to, to Mayor Emanuel, the seeds of the kids deciding to do that, I don't know, it goes back years, years, years before they feel like they're hopeless enough that this is the only route they're going to take. Uh, how, as a mayor, do you begin to address that issue? Well, first of all, you have to create a learning environment. The idea that schools are going to educate children, you have to create a learning environment after school and on Saturdays and during the summer. You, this idea that the schools is the answer to education is not. It's all after school program, Saturday program, weekend, weekend programs, places of worship. But what's happening is we had a, we had a, we had a gun unit. You know, I believe we, America has so many guns that, you know, don't worry about the rest of the world because we have so many guns we can invade anybody. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, we think that the answer to all our problems are guns. But uh, they, they, you have a, we had a, uh, a unit strictly on guns. They collect 100, 200, 300 guns a weekend. They disbanded that unit. You need to specialize. Guns is the key, especially if there's infractions, shootings. You have to get in there quickly and gather guns up. Walking, people walking down the street, cars, that's number one. Number two, you need a specialized unit dealing with gang unit. Citywide, disbanded two of them. You have to use your technology to the best use of the police officer in these killings. A 59-year-old 59, 59 uh, ex-gang uh, 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 member coming back to the gangs, he has no relationship. They're the 14- to 18-year-olds. Yep. These are the killers. It's all yep. drug-related. 
Yep. You have to do RICO statute by the U.S. Attorney, which they have not done on a daily basis. They don't RICO statute gang members, only politicians and business people. No gang bangers. We had a case, $85 million of fraud, real estate mortgage fraud. Gangs got together very smart. These are smart people. Got lawyers, Absolutely. figured it out. $85 million, they indicted one person. He had a weekend probation. And they didn't indict any gang leader. No one else was indicted. $85 million in loss. No one says anything. It's the Justice Department, the federal government. Everybody's afraid of them. You know, so, and that's what's happening. It is the, basically, the federal government refuses to participate. A gun comes from Mississippi. Drugs come from all the way throughout the world. And they say it's a local problem. And again, it, I call it dysfunctionalism. It has nothing to do with the present administration. Basically, historical going on for the last 30 years. I was a prosecutor for 10 years. And uh, you have to have a good relationship. The Attorney General has to understand that local government is important in fighting crime. And they have to, they have to be partners. And they cannot be, uh, they cannot be uh, silos. And they're a silo today. Now, I, just want, I want to let's like build on that because I think your question is so important. Um, you know, he mentioned my thing about the creative class. We actually looked at the creative class versus the college grads. You know that 40% of the people working in the creative industries don't have a college degree. And then I reflect back on my youth. The smartest kids I ever met were in Newark and North Arlington, New Jersey. The smartest kids. They were smarter and tougher than the kids I met at MIT and when I taught at Harvard and the University of Toronto. And I was lucky. You know what changed my life? I, the nuns liked me and the brothers liked me and I got a scholarship to Rutgers. And I, at that critical peer, now it was a little older, when the kids started to get the guns and get into drugs, I went to college, they went to jail or drug rehab. So I think what you were saying is very important. And we have to create opportunity. Right. And I do think with these creative industries, whether it's sports, whether it's media, whether it's entertainment, those are th this is pent up energy. Like you said, the kids of the gang are smart. Technology, we've got to find different channels to take that energy well, up because they're not going to go, they're not a nerd, sorry, they're not a nerd like me who's going to sit there in the class like a bump on a log. They're just not going to go for that. I, I sucked it up, but right. I played tough, but I right. sucked it up and got good grades. But, so we've got to create these new pathways. Yeah, you have to pay a whole new education system. Kids will learn visually. Absolutely. It's a different system. So we're still doing the old system. You know, we have two and a half months off during the summer, they're going to go work on the farms. That's what <laughs> everybody believes that. And so the, the, we have to change this whole system, but, and that's the whole system America is still into. That's how, far, that's how far we've come in education. We have not come that far. We have you know, not come that far. We're, talking we're still in the past. We were talking yesterday about what is America's greatest invention. Jazz, music. Yeah, yeah technology is important. So much of what made this country great came from our poorest right. Whether it's Italian kids like me in entertainment, or Jewish kids, or African, or Latino kids, African American kids, whatever, Irish kids, it, it came up. And, and we forget that so much. And I think we've got to, I just want to say that, that we've got to get back to that too. We've got well, to I think that. Uh, I had 10 years as state's attorney, and what you see is basically narcotics and guns in America. And they're all interstate. It's, all, it's, a, it's a federal question, it's not a local question. Federal yeah. government it does, it keeps their hands off of it. Sorry, I just had to get in there. Sorry. Uh, you mentioned drugs. What, how do you feel about legalizing drugs? Well, the problem in legalizing drugs is, is, uh, is the epidemic that we have in America on it. I mean, that's uh, some way we've not educated people through a medical reason. I believe everybody should be medically tested to help the people, not to, not to put them in jail, to help them. And that's your problem. It, we, don't, we have not educated people about drugs. And that's the issue in the suburban area. You go to any suburban hospital, emergency, they're coming into drugs left and right, but they're not quoted as drugs. Right. Child comes in the city, quoted as a drug. So a lot of, a lot of you know, different uh, ways of looking at it. And my theory is that you get younger people on drugs, they struggle the rest of their lives. And that's, how do we do this? And, and, and that's what we have to figure out. But I think we lost the fight educating people on the medical side of what drugs are doing, both, both legal drugs and, of course, illegal drugs. And it's a huge industry. I believe the United Nations should have a huge uh, operation against uh, uh, narcotics trafficking in the world. If you look at Afghanistan, I mean, we should buy the poppy fields. It's cheaper. Burn it down every year and just give them the $30 billion, whatever they want. It's cheaper. <laughs> but again, you know, this is common sense. But, you know, it's just, but we're in a war that we should have been out of five, ten years ago, and we're going to be in it for the next. And every day, my son served there, and every day a child, someone gets killed. No one really reflects upon that anymore.
I, I think, I mean, I don't want, I, I think we should consider it. Yeah. I, I just want to say from where, where I sit, I, I, and I think the other part of it is, you know, I know so many kids who fell into alcohol abuse, and I mean, my friends, most of them lost. We used to do a tally at Rutgers, me and the, the Jewish kid who got in. How many of our friends died every year? I mean, it was the most remarkable yeah. thing, and all in drugs and all of this. It, it was tragic, and you know, we'd, we'd laugh, you know, like battlefield hardened, but I think they didn't find meaning and purpose. They, they drifted into that. We fa somehow, we found our, me and the other guy and a few others found that meaning and purpose, and we moved up. But I think the other part of it is, even though we have to get rid of the drugs, we've got to find a way to give these incredibly in talented young people who feel shut out. Who just, like you said, right. they learn different. They yeah. have different styles. If I, if I couldn't memorize, I had a good memory. That saved my ass. If I, but if I had to be a visual learner, I would have been dead. Yeah. So or put something together, make something. So and, and the I, drug dealers are much smarter. The big thing about, I have found out in drug uh, trade is the uh, money launders. <laughs> we do nothing against money launders. And I go in a community and would say, we're going to do this. They say, Mary, you know it's corrupt. The feds are corrupt. Everybody's corrupt. Look at it. You don't go after the money launders. The $20 we spend, it goes into $600. They wrap it up. Then yep. they give it to the person. I went to the IRS since I've been state's attorney. Every Democratic or Republican administration to get one IRS agent assigned to Chicago. I pay his salary and benefits to go after the 100 top drug dealers who use the money. Yep. Zero. They will not do it. Conflicts, laws, Democrats, Republicans, they won't do it. So the best business to go into money laundering, because very few people are ever, ever convicted. <laughs> if, you're sentenced, if you're ever Advice sentenced to jail, man. you get about two years. So don't even worry. If you money launder 100, 200 million, you're coming back well situated. And that's what they are. And that's why money launders is one of the I best see you. professions. Right, right in the back, there's a <laughs> lovely young woman in the back. We'll wait. They're coming. Yeah, and if you guys keep your hands up now, this young lady can find a next question, maybe. So I'm going to change the subject a little bit. It's a little depressing talking about drug dealers. Uh, I'm Susan <laughs> Chapman, and I'm with American Express. But in my free time, I serve on the board of the Regional Plan Association of New York. And so we're constantly grappling with questions around this whole thing around the mega city and what can you do around it, um, particularly around innovation. And so uh, in the last month, Mayor Bloomberg has announced this prize, this contest amongst cities to come up with the most innovative ideas to drive cities to the next level. And so I'm just curious, what do you think about that? Because he's put his own private money behind it. Yeah, Mike has um, done a great job with the foundation of the money. And that's an example. Exactly. He re reflects what American businesses do continually. And, and helping, you know, not only uh, cities, but people in the country. It's, yes, what's the next innovative idea? Sure. I think it's challenging for every mayor to do that. And it puts a committee together and says, well, is it our city unique? What are we going to do? But remember, you have to look at every city can't be doing this. I mean, you know, it's like what is happening to the business community. You know, you, know, you, you, you acquire things. And, and we're living in the same subdivision we lived 100 years ago, and no company has existed that way, and no university has existed that way. So we are subdivisions, so I, I, and that's the idea. Is a subdivision going to be a suburban area? Are they going to participate with New York, or is it just going to be Newark? Is it going to be New York and Newark? Yeah. They're going to tell us. Is it going to be a suburban area? Is it going to be, you know, that's what you have to figure out, but I think it's a great idea. So we, we, were, we were just talking to the fellow who heads the philanthropies, and I've been, it's such yeah. an amazing thing that yeah. they're doing to, to focus on these, not only innovations, but innovations that can be developed and replicated and expanded. It's, what a gift that is. And then I just wanted to say something about your group. When I think about real mega region planning and mega region strategy, I think of two things. The Port Authority of New York, on the tries to end the RPA, and I told the story yesterday, I don't know if you were there, but I said, all these cities, the guy was talking about Silicon Valley, they can't drive, it's too much traffic. I said, look at New York, 100 years ago, groups like the RPA said, we're going to grow, and you did it in Chicago, your, your, your predecessors, we're going to grow a city that supports 5, 10 million people, we're going to invest in infrastructure, rails, subways. So what the RPA has done is just fabulous, and it's actually a model, you know, I think looking at those regional groups that in Chicago, right. the RPA, right. the yep. Port the Authority, regions. how do you govern the mega regions, we're going to have to learn from you. The clock is ticking. I think we have time for, if somebody can hold their hand up high, one, there's a fellow back there. We have time for one more question, uh, right? We, quick time is six, I'm asking, or quick time is six, right? So one more question. Bob Weinberger, um, your father famously said that good government is good politics right. and good politics <laughs> is good government, and Chicago had a reputation as a city that worked. Um, you have essentially said today that 
you took a partisan office and right. tried in many respects to make it nonpartisan. President Obama at one point was described as someone who wanted to be a postpartisan president, but he seems to be mired in uh, heavily polarized politics. Uh, your brother was there helping him as chief of staff and I'm sure returned to Chicago very frustrated. I, I wonder if you can reflect a little bit on the partisanship right. versus uh, the nonpartisan approach to government. Is that possible in well, Washington? What happened is all those political leaders who came to Roosevelt, one man, one party, they lived through the Depression, the First World War, the Depression, one man, one party, Second World War, it was Roosevelt. He, he was the key. So any, all that generation from the 40s, the 50s, 60s and part of the 70s was that generation. They believed in the Democratic Party and their principles established by Roosevelt. That's who really established the Democratic Party, the coalitions. And then, then in turn, the independent movement started rising. And you saw the independent movement coming up. And then what the, the political system did, the Democrats did more. They, they took over the local political system, the state system, and put everything in Washington. Just like the federal government put everything in Washington. They, they, they basically lessened the control and power of basically mayors and governors in the political system. Everything is DNC, triple C, uh, uh, three R's, four R's, seven R's. It's all that. They moved everything to Washington. And that's what mayors don't care for. Everything is situated in Washington in the political system. They made Congress more political than local government. And now you, you elect a Democratic president. You don't elect... Afterwards, he's a president. Everybody says he's a Democratic president or a Republican president, and that's what's the problem with the country. Uh, I think 2000 changed that. In 2000, people got so bitter and mad. And I don't know what, what happened. It's just a change. Okay, we have a new president. So what? You move on with your life. You know, you're not going to lose any money. And what happened? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the Democrats got so mad right. at the Republican. Harry Reid said the greatest thing. We cannot trust our president will never, ever adjourn, we only recess. So you wonder why Obama has these problems? It was situated for eight years, Democrats so bitter, mad, in parts of the country, they said, well, we're going to get even. The, the elected president, Republicans said, we're going to do the same thing you said. We can't trust our president. And that's the saddest situation. To me, you know, we should always reflect, regardless of who the president is, you should respect the office. We're losing respect for the office, and that is not good for the country. Whether you agree or disagree with presidents, and from my viewpoint, uh, if we don't do that, this country will be more partisan in the future. Well, just want to say, first of all, thank you to all of you. Um, your questions and your contributions and your energy helped to make this festival okay. spectacular. And I just want to say a personal thanks and a okay, thanks thank from our colleagues at the Aspen Institute in the Atlantic. Yes to Rich Daly, America's greatest mayor. Let's give you a Thank great you. round of applause. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Thank you. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. An honor to be with you.